Hi and welcome. You're watching a Windworks subscriber update video by mysterytomastery.com and the title of today's video is Exploring the Psychology and Process of Practice and Performance featuring trumpet and performance psychology guru Mark Bain of the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra and yours truly Greg Spence. Check this out. Many people struggle today to improve on the trumpet and this is because they misunderstand how the instrument works and don't know what or how to practice effectively. Most methods just offer more and more exercises and this is where they fall short. They fail to uncover the real problems. Luckily there's a way to get far better results and it's much faster than I actually ever thought possible. The Amazing Windworks course helped me to improve much faster than other methods by revealing the flaws in my belief systems and my approach to brass playing. With just a few drills and exercises a day I felt my mind and body change like never before and my playing was very and easier than I could ever imagine. It works by eliminating inefficient playing habits and providing a structured and achievable program suitable for players of all standards. Simply go to mysterytomastery.com. That's mysterytomastery.com and sign up for the Wingworks course now. It takes less than a minute, it's free to sign up now and it'll change your life forever. Click the link in the description below to get started. And the research has shown that if you're more certain in what you're doing as you step on stage, then you'll perform better. It's, it's the one plus one approach. What's the one plus one approach? One plus one equals two. Obviously. Yeah. Although apparently there are studies out there that could argue that, but let's not go down that path. <laughs> what is it, 1984? The the book? Is it two plus two equals five or something like that? Oh, okay, righto. Oh, I think that's, let's not, let's that's not scratching my brain. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um if you or I were to be invited to do a solo performance, no orchestra nothing just walk out on stage carnegie hall live streaming to two billion people much like today hmm. right? <laughs> live streaming to two billion people <laughs> we've only got two million on this time so hey we've only got two million on this time not two billion yet so. we'll work on it. Yeah. 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 in fact there are there are two other people in the performance there's the timpani player and there's the narrator. So you get out there and the timpani starts a roll and the narrator says, Mark Bain, what is one plus one? You're not gonna mess it up. You're not gonna say three by mistake. You're gonna make an accident four. Oh, oh. Oh, I got it yesterday, <laughs> the day before. You're going to be pretty confident that you're going to say two. And so that's where we want our technique to be. What can we do? What can we sometimes do? What can't we do? What's one plus one? Two. What's 10 plus five? 15. What's 21 plus 18? Or oh, 39. What's 1.763 million plus multiplied by, you know, what can we do? What can we can breathe? We can stand up. Heart's going to keep pumping. We can clap and scratch our head. I've got to digress for one second because otherwise I'll think about it and we'll finish this and I'll go, oh, I should have just jumped in and said it. Not <laughs> everyone can visualize. Yeah. There is yeah, a condition called aphantasia. Yeah. And from my recent experiences with a student who's got ADHD, whether it's aphantasia or whether it's just a different storage issue, I haven't done the research yet, but basically um, this particular student couldn't, can't remember the lessons and couldn't remember walking down the street three minutes earlier on their way to get a coffee. They know it happened, but they can't actually picture it in their mind. And they thought it was a real skill that only a few people could do. And they, he's watching TV going, imagine in your mind. And he, all his life he thought, well, not everyone can do that. Like, yeah, dude, most people can. Most people, but not everyone. So no matter what strategies you or I or everyone else comes up with, there's always a percentage that it's not going to work for, which is just totally fascinating. Mm. Yeah, which which I think is uh, absolutely, it's really interesting. And, and this is where there is no one way to play your instrument as well. And that's why, that's why I love this, because... 
It's like, I listen to you and I learn stuff, which I can try out. Um, but I know that some of it's going to work and some of it's not. But it's all in pursuit of what's going to work best for me, yeah. for my circumstance. Um, my brother, he has a great saying. He says, test, don't trust. Test everything out. Test out what you hear, but don't trust it until it actually works for you. Right. Um, so you, you build that trust through doing, through action. Repetition. Um, of yeah. Trial and error. yeah, absolutely. So it's really important just to, you know, you, you hear some of the guru teachers and you just go, well, if they say it, it has to work. And it's like, well, no, <laughs> it works for some. It may not work for you. And it works sometimes in a certain circumstance and sometimes not. So it's it's a really testing. And, and this is where testing things out in pursuit of finding out if it works will mean that you make lots of errors along the way. And that's where we're coming back to to that sort of stuff. And it's like, I like to think of the practice room as like, a, have you seen those old movies, like Frankenstein movies with like a crazy scientist with all the test tubes and everything around? I think of the practice room kind of like that. Yeah. And, and you're getting these different <laughs> concoctions together and mixing it together, seeing if it makes a potion and some of it blows up and... Some of it is it works, but the idea is that you're testing things out and exploring and being curious to try and find out what works for you. Absolutely, you have to. Yeah, You've got to think outside the box. Totally. Find what works for you. I spent years and years trying to replicate what I was being taught, hmm. and it wasn't from lack of time, lack of love, dedication, but I was not getting where I wanted to get to with my playing to the point where I was about to give up and it got to the point where I can't just keep doing exercises as you alluded to before. And I've done a video called, you know, good days, bad days. The exercises are the assessment. Mm. You work, you learn in between attempts. Yep. What went wrong? What went right? How did that feel? We play by feel. We play by feel. I oh, had you go today. I felt terrible. I just, I was fighting the horn. I was, you know, I really struggled felt great and it doesn't matter whether you're a swimmer or a golfer you know whatever you're going to have days that feel bad days that feel good so you got to expect when you get on stage and go i remember doing this when i was working eight days a week you know in, in melbourne in my height of my performing career okay it's going to be one of those days you get down you've done your preparation and you sit there and you start playing and you might have been up all night the night before playing and busting your face teaching all day at a school, whatever you've been doing, and you get to the gig and it, it just feels horrible. What do you do? Panic? Mm. There's only one reality. My chops feel terrible. I'm tired of this or that. Use the chops that you've got. Get through the gig. Think musically. Mm. Get that musical message out. And the more you're concerned, fighting against what the body's doing, uh, the better the result. Yeah, there's, there's been a, a lot of research actually into that sort of area is that when things start feeling or not going so well, we start to internalize our focus and we start to think, oh, try to manipulate your face or try to squeeze and do sorts of things. Um, whereas in terms of learning and performance, so the research has shown that if we can have a focus of attention outside of our body, so if you can ha think that your sound, think hear the sound in your head and where it's going in the hall, so you can think that your sound is going to the back row of the of the seats. Then you get out of your own way. You stop trying to control and micromanage everything and you just hear the sound where it's going and your body aligns to that. Right. And yeah, so it's, um, I think I, was, I sent you a few videos of that as well, Greg, and it's fascinating research. And I've, I do this with my students. It's like, they're, I see them worrying about, oh, my chops aren't feeling good or, I'm not really breathing well. And it's like, okay, where's your sound going? What point on the wall are you aiming for? That's all you need to think about. Play. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom, out it comes. Because the conscious mind gets in the way of the subconscious wiring. And mm. the conscious mind's the powerful part. It's our yep. best friend and it's our worst enemy, right? If we learn how to um, uh, get along with it properly, engage it when we need to, disengage it when we don't need to, um the the conscious mind is for learning for reprogramming the subconscious the subconscious is the motor skills get the heck out of the way when it's time to deliver and let it do its thing that's really tough to do 
Roger, Roger Federer, trust your practice, hmm. right? But if, you, if you've got doubt, oh, I don't know about this note, I don't know, oh, 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 tick, 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 wheels turning, you're, you're compromising the skills that you've developed hmm. from the conscious mind. <laughs> this is yeah. a wicked cycle. And that's, that's just technically speaking. And then, of course, the emotions become yeah. involved because of the response to the perceived lack of technical ability. Now, of course, if you expect to outplay, um, I was a comedian, I can't, Bill Cosby, it's a shame to have to go, oh, Bill Cosby. But he goes, if I can't jump my own height, I jump. Why can't I jump one inch above my own height? You know, there's a reality of going, don't expect to be able to do something you've never been able to do before during a performance. That's a bit silly, right? But if you go, okay, well, we'll just see what happens. What does it sound like? Put the sound there. The less your conscious mind is in the way, the higher the likelihood of uh, success. And that external... I after watching the videos that you sent please people if you're watching this friend mark and go and check out all of his material please <laughs> i'm like because i do that external focus thing because i'm very visual about i just want to see the ball fly that way hmm. and if it goes that way into the trees which it does and that way into the lake which it does and i do it all the time and unlike most people i'll stand there and hit seven balls into a lake that's a true story one after the other Best way to learn. I don't care. You, you're frustrated in a healthy way, not a negative, angry. We've got to learn how to harness frustration. Um, Andrew Huberman. Yeah. But anyway, uh, if you don't know who Andrew Huberman is, please re uh, check out his podcast. Oh, check him out. He's, just, yeah. Um, yeah. His podcast uh, is amazing. It's, it, some episodes go for three hours, though, but, you know, it's chock full of amazing stuff. He's well, so, good, so, so good, so, so good. So after watching yours, I'm like, okay, what's the role of the club head when I'm playing golf? What does it do? It needs to go around that way and come through that way. Mm. Focus on the club head. There's no body. There's yep, just what's yep. the club head doing? I want the club head to go roop, roop, and it will pick the ball up on the way through. And hopefully send it on its way so you focus on that and get the mind the sub the conscious mind that you've been you utilizing to train these real deep skills we've done that we've sent the invitations out now let's see what happens mm. and so you turn that off and go oh club head Vroom. amazing when you let go of all these little things in the body mm. i i sent those i said hey greg i sent those videos not only for your music, but yeah, to help your golf game. So, you know, it's all sports psychology research. <laughs> no, not really. But um, definitely. Of, 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 of really intricate skills. Intricate. Where does the mouthpiece fit? sit on the lips? You know, it's... We don't have to think about it. We put it there. Well, we, for... we, don't, have, we don't have conscious control over all of it anyway. Right. And and it's it's you're trying to exert control over something which is uncontrollable, and that just, um, yeah, it just constrains. It's uh, it's called the constrained action hypothesis. It's like everything is you're you're trying to control it, and uh, as soon as we let go and focus on something outside of your body, then magic happens, and you right. you you'll be really surprised as well. Like, like the listeners, hopefully they'll try this out, try it out, and see, have a focus of attention outside of your body and where your sound is going experiment with where the point is outside of your body but i think you'll be pleasantly surprised how much easier it is and and uh you probably do it to a certain extent as you said greg um like you do this and i've been doing it for years but now reading the research it's like now i can consciously do it so that now i'm like ah oh, okay right i know yeah. this is going to work so yeah and the 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 important part is is to remain the observer. Mm. Yep. See what happens. Be prepared to miss. Mm. Be prepared to miss. Be prepared to sound bad. Be prepared yep. to split. Be out of tune. Crack it. Airy. Be prepared for it to not be the perfect note. Because mm. if you want to play the perfect note, you've turned 
you flipped over psychologically into the performer player mode and your consciousness is on play the note, not the focus. Let go of the desired outcome mm. and observe the desired outcome after the assessment. You get the results, 100%. Oh, failed. Oh, now I know what I need to work on. Yeah. It's so hard to trust pure process yeah. when it comes to activating. I practice golf with my eyes closed and then put the ball there with my eyes closed, mm. right? And then hit the ball and you should see the difference in the swing when you're looking at the ball. Must mm. hit ball, everything tightens. No, do practice swing, eyes closed. What does it feel like? Go up to ball, replicate the feeling. Don't try and hit the ball because you're going to bloom and you're consciously getting in the way of other things that you've programmed and you've just, you've put a kink in the programming. Mm. Wild, isn't it? It's so mm. hard to let go of controlling that, that result. And that's the same thing, whether it be in the practice room or in the, in a performance on stage, you know, what are your main strategies to get people from, I walk on stage and I've got butterflies. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm aware of that I've got butterflies or I'm not aware I've got butterflies. Mm -hmm. They turn up sometimes right at the moment. Sometimes they build up. Mm -hmm. What What are your main tricks? So it really depends on the individual as well. Yeah. But I, the first thing I get every one of my students and clients to start to think about is first of all, to become aware of how you respond under stress. Become aware of what sort of things go on like do you, do you get butterflies does your heart rate go through the roof mine is that i get a dry mouth and so once you can actually recognize that's going on then you can actually develop some strategies for when that happens then you go okay it's not taking me by surprise anymore so what can i do as a strategy when that happens again yep and so so a lot of like you hear a lot of string players they get shaky bow or we get the shakes as well and it's like okay when that happens because it probably will happen again that's okay but then we can actually say okay where's your focus going to go now quite often and this is where i do a lot of work with focus of attention is like if you start if you're starting to shake if your sound's starting to shake what do you start to focus on and generally the focus goes internal you start to focus on the muscles and go, oh, my, my chops are shaking, so I have to do this. Whereas then it's about my focus needs to be externally outside of my body and listening to the sound that I'm producing and also the character and the emotion, the effect that I want to create. Now, that's easier said than done. <laughs> But but the idea is that you're recognizing and being a, an observer of your experience. So you're observing what's going on, right. observing your body and ob observing those reactions. And then you're observing where your focus is going. And then you're diverting your focus onto the thing that's most important, onto the task at hand. Yeah. So it's really like I do a, a lot with mindfulness and meditation sort of stuff in in order so that we can become more observant of what we actually experience on stage. Sure. And sure. then then you're living at cause, you're, you're living more proactively or you're playing more proactively rather than effect. You're not being to, to the effect of everything going on around you. You're not just reacting and, you know, getting thrown around in the, in the waves. It's just like, no, okay, you can make conscious choices. Um, yeah. We just, I haven't read it, but I'm, we have just got a message here through from one of my most dear friends, playing colleagues for many, many years. Uh, he's psychic. He doesn't realize he's psychic, but he is. <laughs> he knew what I was going to do when I was playing before I knew. He was the second trumpet player on Dancing with the Stars, one of Australia's great trumpet players, Mr. Shane Gillard. Shane, thanks for the comment here. Hi, Shane. Um, I hope you haven't called us names because I haven't. <laughs> Here we go. The, the fear of a catastrophic performance has definitely been a trigger for performance anxiety. I've found it helpful to examine the logic of those thoughts and logic and reality can be put in the same 
ask it. The answer for me has been to identify that I have done the work in the practice room. I told you, he's a, this guy's an absolute genius. You've done the work in the practice room, trust your practice. And therefore, the likelihood of a catastrophe, uh, catastrophe in performance is extremely low. And a missed note here and there will not matter if my intention is to play with musicality. Love your work, yep, gents. Yep. Shane Gillard. Thanks, Shane. Great. Absolutely, 100%. We're not saving lives. No. We're human. We're going to make mistakes. But if we're not worried about making mistakes, we probably won't. And if we keep making mistakes, well, then there's an issue. If the car keeps comp comp conking out on the third lap of the Formula One Grand Prix, <laughs> there's a mechanical issue. But yeah. the driver is not sitting there trying to adjust the fuel flow and adjust the brakes and the transmission while going down the, the straight at 300 mile an hour. If you try and, oh, I better check that my accelerator pedal's working properly, you're probably going to crash, right? So we've got to, and that ties in beautifully to the high performance vessel yeah. of we are trying to develop. I, I believe that every human, if they've got lips and lungs, hands, or you can get away with one hand, <laughs> balance can play whatever they want on a brass instrument i really believe that and i know there are a lot of people out there going nah no nah. takes a special sort of someone to to do that sort of playing or this sort of playing yeah well that, i mean that that also ties in with like our mindset and whether you have the belief that you can grow and learn and there's been a lot of research on this as well with um with a, a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset and if you believe that you can grow and that you can learn and that you can change, which through brain plasticity we've sh has shown that you can, um, our brain is not hardwired to, you know, you're not a born trumpet player. You, No one is. <laughs> Far out. If we were, then I'm in trouble. Um, <laughs> but um, the idea is that you can believe that you can change those skills. Everything is temporary. So if you if you can't play something yet, keep working at it and you can still develop those skills if Absolutely. you're working at it. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't like the term neuroplasticity. Plastic. How come? Oh, this is interesting. Plastic's hard. Plastic's not malleable. Yeah. I'm going to come up with a new word. I do that. Oh. <laughs> neural, neural something that's malleable. R rubbericity. <laughs> we'll work on that yeah <laughs> eradicative if julie's watching this is funny because with dystonia a lot of people work trying to come up with ways around it some people say there are no cures for focal dystonia some people use botox please don't do that right Focal dystonia, it's a neurological issue, right? So we need to change the right way that we think because the muscles, the muscles are dumb, as Hoogman says, that they respond to the messages from the brain. So we've got to clarify the messages from the brain. Completely lost my train of thought because I thought of two things at once just then. You're probably still thinking of brain plasticity and brain, brain, brain rubbericity or something. It's totally that. Is, <laughs> oh, eradicative. Yeah. Thank you. Well, well done. Um, <laughs> people think that it, there's no cure for it. And that's like saying we're not able to reprogram our thoughts because it's all about monitoring our thoughts. Now, our thoughts are messages, and I believe negative messaging plays obviously a major role in performance anxiety and mm. and focal dystonia. I believe there is a finite amount of negative messages that can come from wherever they come from in the brain. Right? There are messages come from somewhere. And I believe there are a finite amount of negative messages that can be sent from the brain. So therefore, we want to, I don't want to adapt. I don't want to be adaptive. 
right? We can adapt, we can come up with strategies to adapt to the current environment, whether it be performance or dystonia. And we need to do that. We need to have survival strategies to get through those moments. However, ultimately, wouldn't it be great to eradicate any sense of, I'm going to walk on stage, I don't care how many people there are. I don't care what I need to play. I can either play it or I can't. I can play it in the practice room and I'm pretty confident. So I'll just see how it goes, right? Imagine if we could get everyone to just go walk on stage and just think music and try their best, play their best and enjoy. Remember that feeling, that dopamine rush as the youngster when you learn to play something, you heard the instrument for the first time and you had a love for the sound. Of, oh, I want to do that. Imagine if everyone had the skills of a, of a professional musician and walked out with the love of the performance and the sound of an eight-year-old or 10-year-old or 13-year-old or something. Imagine the sound that would be made. I don't know that there's an orchestra on the planet where every single musician gets out there going, oh, I'm so excited to play today. And there's not one kind of negative message going, don't miss that. You're not capable of doing that. And there's not one message coming. I call them scud missiles. They come in your scud missiles, shoot that negative message down. It's like, imagine if all the thoughts going through every musician on stage is, this is so hip, I'm going to give to the orchestra with the best sound I've ever played, and this is going to be brilliant. Mm. Every single member. Tell me that's not going to be the best orchestra you've ever heard. Oh, you know? Sign me up. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I believe that I, I was using the word eradicative, and Jules <laughs> like, there's no such word. You can't. I said, I don't care. I'm going to invent a word. I do that. <laughs> eradicative and it turns out i said it that many times and she's gone that's it she googled it eradicative the process of eradicating there we go <laughs> it already exists right <laughs> so what can we do what can we sometimes do what can't we do one plus one hmm. one plus one equals two the brain tells us it's three it's an error so we've got to keep making the error until we learn and we get it right and i believe that anyone can and i'm coming from a history of performance anxiety mm. and having to deal with it those first three seasons of dancing with the stars i used to walk off the adrenaline was so up i'd still focus and get the job done but the heart's going a million miles an hour and that was the early days when there was only one trumpet i didn't have my buddy shane to bloom and nurse me through it <laughs> <laughs> You've got to just do what you've got to do to get through. But I got to the stage, and I, this comes back to the visualisation of I'm sitting at home practising and I'm sort of paying it forward. In my practice room, I'm imagining myself and Chong Lim, the hmm. MD, because we used to have all this blooming... And you got two seconds notice and the red light's in your face. Deliver. Mm. Right. And I'm like, I'm tired. The energy that it wastes being nervous or hyped or whatever takes a lot of energy. We don't want to waste energy on that. We want to put our energy into the love of the music, not freaking out the, the body fight and flight issues. So I'd sit at home and put myself in a little bubble and imagine it's just Chong and me. And he's looking at me, got his cans on. And he's said something that's made the band laugh, and generally with a swear word. <laughs> It'd be chuckling, but then it's business. And I've been practicing this in my practice room at home. I'm in the studio. I'm visualizing the studio. I'm visualizing the red lights. And it's just me and Chong. So when I got to the show, I thought, right, what did I send forward? With my dystonia teaching now, it's building tomorrow. What did we send forward from yesterday? What do I want to achieve today? What well, what commands did I set out? Well, yesterday, what I sent forward was I was in my practice room. So let's go back and have a look at that now. So I'd be sitting in the studio imagining I'm in, in my practice room and it's just me and Chong 
red lights on, count down and play. And I'd replicate what I did in the practice room. Mm. And I did that for three seasons until it got to the point where I've gone, this is freaking ridiculous. It's just a gig. I'm getting up on Sunday nights in front of people and they're dancing. Mm. I'm getting up on Monday night on television and there's people dancing and there's an audience. Get over it. Just play. Have mm. fun. And eventually got to the point where we just had fun. Yeah. But, it's yeah. A but I reckon, Greg... Greg, what I'm what I'm hearing from you though is that you're <clears throat> you're trying to replicate your experience, that what you're experiencing in performance. You're trying to replicate that in in practice as well, which I think a lot of musicians don't tend to do. Is that they go from a calm, controlled environment in the practice room, and then they go on stage and freak out because the jump is way too big. Yeah. Whereas then, if you can. Um, a good quote to remember is practice like you play and you'll play like you practice. Right. So that you're, you, it sounds like you, through visualization and through your preparation, then the gap between the actual performance and your practice was like that as opposed to like that. So it's, it's the same yeah. thing because I mean, I, it, you've got a little bit of extra pressure there, but uh, <laughs> no, it's, it comes down to care factor. And I've got to be yeah. careful when I say this yeah. because it doesn't, mean that I don't care. Mm. I don't care if I miss a note. Yeah. So then I just, and there's one reality. There's one now. Let's see what happens. Trust your practice. Yeah. I, 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 they're all really powerful statements if yep. you can embrace them. Yeah. And so I'll try to make them exactly the same. Hel Gelper, famous piano player with all the jazz greats, he calls it chaos. And when he was talking about the chaos, he was talking more about the, the sound environment where we practice at home and you can hear yourself and you know what to expect. And then you get on stage and there's amplifiers and singers or percussion section. I, my brain instantly goes to West Side Story with Melbourne Symphony trying to play the, um, the gymnasium scene and mumbo and, and thousand freaking percussionists behind me. I couldn't hear a note that I was playing, right? <laughs> so... Rule number one, if you can't hear yourself, play softer. <laughs> Don't mm. try and fight the environment. The ear goes, I know what I sound like. I want to sound like that. And then you get into a different environment and you can't hear yourself. What's the first thing we do is throw out mm. all of the beautiful technical things that we've been working on and force the body to do all this stuff to try and satisfy the ear. You cannot fight the environment. So that's an audit that like an audible issue where you just I, I definitely i definitely hear that with with a lot of inexperienced musicians that come through and all of a sudden <clears throat> big orchestra we play a bit louder and they start to push and stretch and squeeze and you know <clears throat> i think it comes down to trust at the end of the day you, you really come back to really trusting that what you've done in the practice room will flow through um and sometimes it has to be a little bit of blind trust but um Definitely for younger musicians, I think it's coming in and just sitting back on it and, and not trying to push and squeeze and just yeah. trust all that great work that you've done. Absolutely. So when they're at home practicing, guys, shut your eyes. I'm practicing mm. the second movement of the Haydn. Mm. What does it feel like? Because you get up in front of the orchestra and all of a sudden environment changes mm. and you go, oh, oh, it's a lot louder or I can't hear myself because in a, in a concert hall, as you very well know, the, the sound gets swallowed up in the vacuum of the room. Mm. So you're not going to hear yourself the same. So what does it feel like? And if you know, if you can equate in your mind, this feeling equals this sound. Mm. Just because your ear can't hear it doesn't mean the sound's not there. Mm. So you have to trust the feeling and... The sound has to be there because it's not like your instrument's yeah. not working. <laughs> All of a well, sudden. quite quite often in the in the section, if I'm playing and I can't hear myself, that's a good thing because that means that I'm blended in and I've my intonation is good. Whereas if I can hear me, if I can hear my own sound, I'm like, oh, I'm either too loud or playing out of tune or something like right. that. So right. it's definitely a, a it's an indicator. But but I think as well, it's important that when you do get in those environments, that it's again less reactive you're you're more observing what's going on and so we're 
you might be you might be sort of freaking out a little bit, but as, if we can take a more observational approach and say, okay, what's going on? What's going on? And be as flexible as we possibly can in that environment. Then, because as soon as we have pressure, we tend to constrict and contract and then become really rigid. Whereas if we can stay open and observing our experience, then we can actually go with the flow a little bit more and get a better result at the end of the day. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I shared with you when we spoke on Friday, when we decided to do this one, uh, yep. my experience uh, working with the Queensland Symphony. Mm. And it was the recording of the music, two sessions, two full days of recording, or two, three, two, uh, three, three hour sessions, both days. Mm. And I get there and the butterflies are there. It's an orchestra. I don't know anyone. And they're playing a couple of orchestral things. And I'm like, I have to sit down with a bunch of players with a book of music this big, high notes, loud notes, two days of playing. These guys don't know who I am. It, you know, I was having butterflies, right? But thankfully, after years and years of experience and lots of teaching, getting telling people that playing is no harder than humming, talking, singing, mm, I was reminding myself, don't play any harder than that, Greg. Just get up there and do what you do in the practice room and do what you teach. Don't try and get up there and be a hero. Play the hell out of the first track. Waste half of your gas tank and then be struggling for the next two days to have the chops to get through the recording session. So I'm getting my trumpet out and they're playing and the butterflies are starting to get quite erratic. Mm, don't overblow, Greg, don't overblow. Mm, and I'm just humming, just reminding myself, don't blow harder than that. Don't blow harder than that. If you're not sure what I'm talking about and you don't believe me and you're a trumpet player, come and check out Windworks. It's all explained. Mm. <laughs> right. mm, so I did that for a while. And the butterflies went away. That's weird. That's really weird. Now I told you that story and what did you say? Mm -hmm.